Thank you very much, Joshua. Um, I'm just a mere practitioner. Um, I come from across the road, and uh, I have to deal with people, and I have to deal with constituents, and I also have to deal in a practical sense with democracy. Uh, it is my firm belief, um, having practiced constitutional law before I came into Parliament for about 20 years, um, that uh, the system that we've got, um, imperfect as it may be, uh, is for many reasons far better than the idea of having um, what would effectively be a very inflexible system which would not be able to deal with the problems which come up, in my opinion, uh, on a fairly regular basis. Having regard, and I make a special point here, about the effect of the European Constitution, um, which is currently uh, overlaying our current parliamentary system. Frankly, uh, I believe that if there were a written constitution, it would need to be the European Constitution as things stand. Uh, I really do not believe for one minute that it would be possible, uh, given the invasiveness of the European uh, Lisbon Treaty, uh, and we're now talking about do we now need a written constitution, to be able to avoid the uh, imposition, effectively, uh, of the European Constitution as part of the settlement that would lead to the Constitution which Richard is calling for. Um, I mean, if I'm wrong, then we'd have to effectively leave the European Union uh, because it would then assert that this written Constitution which is being created um, by domestic law would be uh, alien to the European Constitution which exists. Um, and. I say the European Constitution exists because to all intents and purposes uh, it is there with us all day, 60% of our laws emanate from the European Union and I would go further and say that uh, um, it is only there as it happens because of a voluntary act which was passed in 1972 as Lord Bridge made clear in the Factor Tame case and therefore uh, we are uh, able to make adjustments if we need to do so. And I won't go into the details of my sovereignty bill other than to say that it's only four clauses long and it would say that where necessary in our vital national interests, if the European system doesn't work to the advantage of the people I represent, then we will be able to uh, override that law uh, and require the judiciary just next door in the Supreme Court and elsewhere to, uh, uh, to comply with the latest Westminster enactments under McCarthy's and Smith, British uh, Rail, Garland and British Rail and uh, metric martyrs. So that is the problem which I see now. So I think we have to ask the question, uh, would the European Union actually uh, be something that we would want to uh, be entrenched into this written constitution, this codified constitution now. And I don't think, if I may say with respect to Richard uh, <clears throat> and to Professor McLean, that they really dealt with that question. I don't think it's practical, and I, I don't think it's practical to assert that we now need a written constitution having regard to that dimension. I would also say that Lord Judge himself recently, Lord Chief Justice, uh, in relation to the Human Rights Act and the Strasbourg Convention only about a month and a half ago, um, said uh, with regard to the Convention, let alone the Human Rights Act, uh, we must beware. And he said that because he said that our first duty of the judge is, judges is to assert uh, the common law and uh, that he was extremely concerned, and I'm paraphrasing him, uh, about the manner in which uh, the European Convention was operating in relation to precedent and the manner in which ju the judiciary was applying those precedents. We also have Lord Hoffman in a very important speech about a year, a year and a half ago uh, speaking in similar terms about his concern uh, about the federalizing tendency of the court in Strasbourg. So we have some very eminent judges who are themselves questioning the basis on which the European Convention <laughs> operates and I would simply add Geoffrey Robertson has said much the same very recently, as some of you will know. However, I do believe that the flexibility that our Constitution has and will continue to have with the retention of parliamentary sovereignty has proved its worth, 
And I would also say that we need flexibility, particularly in a time of political crisis and as the world becomes more and more international. The very fact of global governance should put us on notice that on the principle of subsidiarity, it is extremely important to keep our connection with the people who I mentioned at the beginning, which is the people, for example, who I represent, and to ensure that we can be flexible in our response to their requirements. And finally, I would simply say, with respect to the question of uh, Richard's assertion, and I think I heard him correctly when he said that this was an anti-democratic parliament, that actually I entirely and totally disagree with him. You wouldn't expect me to say anything else, would you? But I can assure you that we have genuine accountability. We do have problems which do occur. Uh, the very fact that I was able to lead the rebellion against the Maastricht Treaty, which at the time was incredibly unpopular, which made me incredibly unpopular in my own party, but I would simply invite other people who can be reasonably objective about this to ask themselves the question whether in fact we were right or not. And I think in the light of the way Europe has gone since, there are many people who would say that that democratic right to be able to resist the um, imposition of this uh, then a treaty which created European government uh, would gain a great deal of democratic support. So mine is a practical argument. It's about the reality of the European Union as it now is. But also, and finally, I would say, we do not want judicial control. The most important thing is to ensure that people make decisions, not judges. And I would simply finally refer to the fact that uh, it is not unknown in the United States uh, for them to attempt, through the presidential powers of prerogative, to pack the Supreme Court. And I really do think that the reason why our side of the debate should be supported is because we are fundamentally both flexible and democratic. And I entirely repudiate Richard Gordon's assertion that we are an anti-democratic parliament. Thank you very much.